Welcome everybody. Welcome to the Halloween special with James Hughes. We're going to be discussing algorithms and post-human governance. We might even get onto a little bit of um, Cambridge Analytica, but I was thinking maybe that could be good for another video because it's such a big topic right now. It's, oh my goodness. So yes, how are you doing, James? I'm great, how are you? Great. I, I've just realized that there is, um, yes, it's good. I've, managed to mute the open window in the background. So yeah, uh, well, James, you, you're bringing out a paper um, right now uh, on this particular subject. So I just wonder if you could give us a brief overview and background on it. I just should mention that James Hughes, for all of you who probably uh, do know anyway, most of you know that James Hughes is the um, manager at, or the director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology, um, and has had a lot to do with the transhumanist movement uh, and, um, Yes, in the techno progressive area especially so yeah I was on the board of humanity plus for many years as well um, so yeah w welcome James sorry for not introducing you properly but yeah would you like to give an overview of the paper you're um, about to submit Wow you, but you you are sounding like a robot to me. I don't know what it's like for everybody else. Okay, that's better. Cool. Check, check, check. check. Does that sound better? Yeah, that's a massive okay. microphone. Uh, <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll just sit here with my Yeti. Um, it's This This is called the Yeti mic. It's a, a special podcast mic. Oh, cool. Um, but if it sounds good now, it's fine. Um, so, uh, Stefan Sorgner is a fellow of the IET and yeah. a Nietzsche scholar, and he's written many books about uh, music and other topics. Um, and he has had this project for years and uh, it does Herculean work to try to bring together uh, European uh, philosophers and post-humanist scholars in the humanities in general with transhumanists to talk about what he calls the meta-humanities or the, the, the confluence of these different strains of discourse about post-humans and uh, post-humanity. And so the Journal of Post-Human Studies, that's its project. And the first issue came out uh, this summer. And I've been editing the second issue, which has <clears throat> a couple articles from folks who are in the uh, literary and humanities post-humanism domain. And then uh, a couple articles um, that are more of the transhumanist domain, one from Hank Greeley, he doesn't consider himself a transhumanist, but he's a bioethicist who has written a recent book about uh, whether we will be giving up on sex and parenting as we know it. And he has some uh, political re uh, reflections on that. So this issue is uh, basically about politics. Um, and I have written an essay uh, that is a riff on, uh, you had gotten me an invitation actually last summer to speak to the IEEE Norbert Wiener special meeting there in Melbourne. That's right. And, uh, and I had a great time doing that and uh, put together a very, as, as is my want, to put together a very elaborate overview of all the issues I thought needed to be touched on. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally took the opportunity of um, this politics issue of the Journal of Post-Human Studies to pull it together as an essay. And uh, I, I'm trying to do a couple different things with the essay. Uh, one is to reflect on the, the excellent work that John Danaher had really brought to my attention um, about uh, the issue of algorithmic governance, which I think two years ago was our top um, article of the year at the IET. It got a lot of uh, attention. And he started a whole project of uh, podcasts and conferences and books. Uh, he's just come out with a book uh, about these issues uh, and, and in a volume. Um, and I think, you know, his work needs a lot more attention. Uh, but I had some reservations, not so much about his work, which is very careful, but um, about the general discourse about this issue of algorithmic governance that it uh, seemed to me quite ahistorical um, in its approach to what uh, the problem was of, of algorithms, and um, it seemed to uh, reify the distinction between technology and human 
institutions in ways that is a problem in a lot of the uh, bioconservative literature or techno-conservative literature, Luddite literature. Um, and so I really wanted to kind of dig into those issues, but also the Norbert Wiener stuff had given me a great opportunity to think about it in the context of um, the history of cybernetics and how the Soviet Union had attempted to co-opt cybernetics both as, a, as an ideology and also as a technology for potentially doing a completely planned economy and how that related to questions about socialism and, and uh, planned economy. So I try to do a whole bunch of different kinds of things in this essay. Um, and I actually, I, I had gotten some critical comments back from John that he thought I needed a clear narrative. But, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, I start with the history of enlightenment enthusiasm for the technocratic state. That basically the idea of a, st of a state bureaucracy um, is the idea of writing down rules for how we do things, right? So that you don't have a different, every time you go to fill out a form to, be, to do X with the government, uh, that there's rules for what you have to do and, and how you have to do it. And that every uh, person that you encounter doesn't come up with a new set of rules. That's kind of the, the basic logic of why we want bureaucracies. We want there to be rules. They can seem to be quite uh, uh, arbitrary or um, burdensome, but rules themselves are right. far superior to the, to the alternative. <clears throat> and okay, rules so, so, are... So, so, so let's just define what you mean. Like algorithms yeah, are really just a bunch of order, like uh, rules in a sense. Um, and you, you want to make clear that um, rules, uh, the, the, the kind of rules that are going to be instituted in uh, these bureaucracies um, and the idea that, you know, people often see bureaucracies as being very inefficient. And if it's an inefficient um, execution of certain rules, might not be able to keep up with the, the pace of technological development. Well, that's certainly the concern that many uh, critics of governance have and the experience of many people about governance is that uh, the rules then become an obstacle to efficiency of various kinds. But in a way, they are also uh, an accelerator of efficiency because the alternative of not having any rules is also quite unattractive. I mean, it's this is like, you know, the, the debate with the libertarians is, oh, if we could just get government out of the way, then we could have the pure market do things. Well, guess what? The market is a creation of the state. You don't have markets unless you have enforced rules about how people buy and sell things and you have governments keeping track of who owns stuff uh, and you have uh, uh, currencies. You know, so rules are incredibly important, but yes, they have to be also be flexible. And so there's a, a contemporary critique of the inflexibility and uh, right, authority yeah, the and inflexibility, and, and there needs to be like a, you know, like a people like to have agile agility, such that people can have uh, so governments can respond to uh, new developments. Like for instance, if it does turn out that you know, kids in their backyards have the technology to create cheap biotech labs and, and start going, falling about with, you know, manipulating um, viruses and, you know, that, that gets out of hand. But it takes seven years to make a policy on this sort of thing. It might be far too late. Right. And that I, I address this issue further on, which is that there are a lot of advantages to the algorithmicizing of bureaucracy that to the extent that we can make a um, a state that gets rid of the humans so that it doesn't take a human to pass a paper to another human to do these various kinds of things, then in fact an algorithmic state, a state which translates all those rules into uh, software, may be as efficient in, uh, in, as it would be in comparison to all other kinds of automation. And, um, and so that's the kind of the second uh, piece of the argument. Well, I, I, then I, I review the, the issue of um, planned economy and the socialist calculation debate and say, you know, this, the, the Soviets got very enthusiastic about uh, algorithmicizing their state and their uh, governance of their economy, but they just didn't have the computers for it. They didn't have 
it, it would have taken, uh, by some people's calculation, more than five years to collect all the economic data that they needed to have an economic plan for a five-year plan, right? So uh, that you got a big problem there. Um, and they hardly had any computers devoted to it back in the 60s and 70s when they were first starting to think about this. So, um, but, you know, I've been very interested in, and we just came out with a, an edited volume about technological unemployment. And most of the attention to technological unemployment has been to private sector uh, automation, um, uh, understandably. And, but there's an equal uh, amount of attention that should be paid to public sector automation, particularly because one of the concerns I've had is that there will be, a, and there already are, an emerging number of policy responses to technological unemployment. And one of them is that, well, look, there's all kinds of jobs in society that need to be done, and we just need to find some way to get them done. Um, so, you know, trees need to be planted, old people need to be taken care of, kids need to be educated, and so forth. And insofar as we don't have robots to do these, well, guess what? Maybe we do, we will have robots do some of these things. You know, for, for every public sector job that people imagine the displaced private sector workers um, uh, being hired to do, uh, there is potentially uh, a form of automation, right? You, for instance, with the post office. I mean, we, we have this term in the United States, going postal. I don't know if it's used in, in uh, Australia, but um, the idea of going well, postal. I haven't, heard that. I haven't heard that, but I actually um, was one of the people who helped automate a lot of the, the, uh, the postal services. I used to work for Australia Post. Um, oh, really? And there's a lot of data uh, that needs to be sort of shipped around to various systems. And I was working on um, extracting, transforming, and loading data from all sorts of um, sort of systems to other systems. And there were all sorts of problems that went went wrong um, because the yeah, timings were out and different people were managing different systems. Yeah, so it. But I, I mean, of course, it was way more efficient. But still, there need to be humans in the loop to make sense of the, these algorithms and you know if they weren't uh, developed correctly from uh, day one or if they weren't managed correctly uh, things went wrong so well sure i mean but that's true of every automation process uh you know every supply chain that has is automated it's going to be more complicated than people imagine but the, the end result of the automation of postal work is that you know, we've halved the postal employment in the United States over the last 20, 25 years. And it was partly the pressures created by that uh, decline in employment opportunity that um, caused a lot of postal workers to go nuts and, and maybe also the nature of the automated work. Um, but at any rate, the, the point is that if we imagine that somehow the state is going to magically pick up all the slack in a future context in which um, for every uh, tree planting job, it's it costs a tenth to uh, have a tree planting robot as opposed to a tree planting human uh, do those same jobs. Then you know there won't be any fiscal logic um, to have humans do those things. And so I pulled together some evidence about the uh, apparent uh, uh, decline in public sector employment in the OECD and around the industrialized world. And that this is the first, uh, since 2008, the first major recession, which there hasn't been an increase in the proportion of uh, public sector employment. And the plans that, for instance, the military has for uh, replacing human soldiers and sailors and so forth with uh, robots and drones and so forth, um, uh, the plans that we have to automate various functions of legal work, um, and the you know those kinds of uh, algorithms, uh, sentencing algorithms, as an example. Now we're not you know there's no there's not been any unemployment among judges yet, um, and so part of the debate about technological unemployment is to what extent does a job get just transformed by the addition of automation? It becomes uh, you know a different kind of more efficient job. Uh, than it was before. In the case of judges, you can uh, clearly understand they're powerful enough and central enough to their occupation that they're not going to suddenly say uh, to the judges, you know what, we only need half as many judges this year because these sentencing algorithms make it possible to do twice as much work with just one judge. 
Um, but in a lot of the other spheres of public sector employment, that will and is happening. So, you know, I call that the withering of the state uh, through automation. It's not the kind of withering of the state that Marx and Engels imagined. They thought that once you had uh, the socialization of labor, that there would no longer be a need for this heavy state apparatus to enforce the rules of capitalism and everyone would cooperate and all men will become angels and all that kind of, uh, you know, pre-modern uh, socialist nonsense. But um, um, I do think there is an ongoing withering of the state. And part of that discussion is happening around this issue of algorithmic governance and its and its defects. And uh, by the way, John uh, and his cohort have recently uh, come out with a paper and it's called, and I, which I highly recommend, uh, and it is called, uh, hold on, uh, Algorithmic Governance, Developing a Research Agenda Through the Power of Collective Intelligence. And it's a product of um, a workshop that they ran and published in Big Data and Society just recently. Um, and uh, it really goes through all the different kinds of debates that are happening around this issue of algorithms and governance and so forth. Um, so uh, I, I don't try to cover all those issues, but one of the things that I then go on to say is, look, there has always been a problem with the democratic accountability and the efficiency of bureaucracies, of governance. Um, as soon as you have hierarchy, then you have this problem of the people at the top of the hierarchy and their apparatus, this, the bureaucratic state, um, not being accountable to the interests of the majority. The, you know, this Hegelian notion that the Prussian state was gonna be the perfect agent of, uh, of you know, the good um, has not turned out to be true, of course. And, is, and uh, the Marxists uh, or Marxist-Leninists, uh, well, I don't know how much they, they learned, but uh, it turned out to be the case that e you know, even if you had a workers' democracy, it has a bureaucracy and it, those bureaucrats have interests and they have dachas and, uh, and they you know, jail their opponents and so forth. So keeping bureaucracies accountable is a problem and you don't get away from that problem when you have a, an alg algorithmic governance. You have to also um, interrogate and correct the systematic biases that tend to favor the powerful uh, groups in society that are baked into the cake when you create those kinds of, of bureaucracy, uh, of algorithmic uh, institutions. So um, thinking about it from that perspective, and I return to the basically the questions that were in Citizen Cyborg, which is, you know, what's the relationship between the enhancement project mm -hmm. and uh, the democratic project? Um, I, I think part of the answer is that we need to develop and, w and are developing um, ways of <clears throat> democratizing citizen deliberation, citizen uh, engagement, uh, and direct ligaments of power. So e-democracy, this notion of you know, facilitating uh, referenda and so forth. But if you, you know, the California uh, experiment is experience with referendas instructive, I think. They have uh, one of the most accessible uh, referenda democracy platforms. It, it takes, you know, like 5,000 signatures or something to get something on the California ballot. And as a consequence, sometimes when you go to the ballot in California, you have like a 50 page thing that you have to vote on because there's so many referenda in there and no one can possibly be expected to be an expert on the all these different referenda and you know the the ligaments of power in our society the reason we developed representative democracy and these bureaucracies is that no one wants to be no individual wants to have to spend 24 7 you know being an expert on democracy nor could could they possibly because they have jobs and families and so forth um, and so we delegate we we have these these institutions where the architecture of choice makes it possible for us to say, look, I, do, I don't want to know about all this stuff. I trust this party or that party. I trust uh, this person or that person. Go do what's in my interest. And I'll, and if I hear that you didn't, I'll, I'll make a decision in a couple of years to, to have somebody else give it a try. And that doesn't work very well. And we want people to be more engaged, but, um, but we're just not there yet. So you know, in, in Alistair uh, Reynolds' work, where he, one of the most creative mm -hmm. science fiction writers, oh, yeah. does post, 
posthuman. He has a, 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 a future society in one of his novels where people have brain computer interfaces and the brain computer interfaces are constantly subconsciously um, uh, negotiating between your interests as a citizen and the decisions that are being made electronically, uh, almost invisibly by the polity. And that, that to me really, you know, it struck home because uh, I think we need some form of imagination about what a, an enhanced cyborg citizen would be. Not, you know, not just to have a cyborg arms and legs to make you run faster and do stuff, not just to have a cyborg brain to make you have a better memory. But what would it mean to have the architecture built into your brain where you were more and more capable of participating in governance and actually articulating and deliberating about the things that are going to affect your life? Um, and so that that was where I was going with this speculation. It's not, you know, not just having electronic uh, means of community, you know, Twitter and and Facebook and all these things are, are facilitating bottom up organizing. It's, I don't see it facilitating that much collective intelligence yet, but in, in some ways it's making us dumber if, you know, Russian psyops and Cambridge Analytica, which I know you want to talk about, is any example. Yeah. But um, But, you know, to the degree to which uh, we can have this kind of onboard democratic artificial intelligence at the individual and uh, bottom up level is the degree to which we can have the kind of ligaments of of uh, countervailing power to the hyper nudging and uh, and and potentially quite dystopian applications of big data algorithmic governance controlled by unaccountable elites and corporations and so forth. So that's right. So, yes. so that is a, that is a fear that many people have, and uh, I share that fear. I, I wonder um, what would have happened if, uh, you know, more than one side had uh, a, a company like Cambridge Analytica both trying to nudge the populace. Would would that have balanced things out, or would have things just gone quite quite a bit crazy there? I mean, it's a shame because Donald Trump didn't actually win the public vote, uh, the 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 majority vote there. He, he won strategically, which may have been informed by what um, by Cambridge Analytica's involvement in the campaign. Well, I don't think that the competition of elites for the uh, allegiance of the masses is my vision of the future of democracy. Right? I mean, that's having you know uh, the feudal lord of Siena mobilize his masses against the feudal lord of Florence doesn't strike me as the what we want, right? We want people to have a truly egalitarian, bottom-up uh, articulation of their own needs and interests through various kinds of groups. Now, to some extent, you know that there are, you know, the Democratic Party represents some of that. The Republican Party represents some of that, and they. You know, the Democratic Party hired uh, or paid Fusion GPS to do research on Donald Trump. You know, so to some extent, our existing ligaments of, uh, of political parties and PACs and public interest organizations and so forth do represent bottom up connections to elite power. But in the end, it was a choice between one royal family, the Clintons, and, and one billionaire. And that really, with the uh, with the assistance of hyper data nudging from Russian psyops and Cambridge Analytica. So yeah, I don't think that that was the vision of democracy that I would have for the future. Right. So um, so if you have a vision for the future, like um, that, that requires seemingly quite a lot of human enhancement to achieve, um, what sort of what sort of strategies do you have to get this from, you know, theoretics in, in papers to be sort of implemented? How, how do you see this going over the next, over the near term, the next five to 10 years? Do people need to, um, you know, get chips in their head or do they just need to become more intelligent, more aware? Does it depend on everybody uh, getting uplifted in some way, getting augmented? Well, I as a social scientist in this transhumanist futurist domain, <clears throat> I find myself constantly in the position of pointing out to people the continuity, the historical continuities 
of the things that they think are so novel and and shocking. You know that um, the idea that we need to have smarter people in order to uh, be a better democracy is not a new one. Uh, you know, as soon as we had literacy, uh, literacy began to improve the quality of democracy. Um, the, you know, you had the the penny universities, where the coffee shops of the uh, 1700s, <coughs> where um, people would print out broadsheets and share them over cups of coffee and argue vigorously about politics. And uh, the monarchs found those to be quite threatening, and for good reason, because those were the the uh, the you know hotbeds of demo of democratic thinking of the Enlightenment. So then you have the 19th century. I mean, we don't we haven't or the 20th century rather. We haven't had you know pre 20th century intelligence tests, but we have the evidence of the Flynn effect through the 20th century, which is that people have in fact been getting smarter, <coughs> and as a consequence. <coughs> Excuse me. The growth of the middle class is bound up with this. I mean, people have gone from being peasants to industrial workers, and the growth of white collar employment, um, and this this industrial and technological change is also bound up with the growth of cognitive capacity: better nutrition, smaller family sizes, better education more cognitively demanding occupations. All of this makes it possible to have citizens who are capable of democratic self-governance in, in increasing ways. And then you these run up against various forms of authoritarianism, monarchy, and so forth, and they've been over gradually overthrown. And that's been part of the spread of democracy. So this is not a, a new question of whether cognitive enhancement is somehow connected to democracy. It is, and it has been for two, three hundred years. <laughs> the whole history of democracy is connected with this. Right, right. But what seems to be the case is uh, getting, um, you know, intelligence amplification or just getting people smarter. Uh, to what level do we need to do this? What, what a, and. A, a, and how can we achieve this in the near term? What are the strategies to get people uh, more aware or, or more rational, such that they'll be able to make better political um, and voting decisions in the future? Well, I think we're debating it right now. Um, uh, the the be, every step leads to the next one. So right now we're debating: is there some way to write an algorithm that would allow Facebook to detect fake news? I mean, this is a date. It's you know, it's a an architecture question. It's a, an artificial intelligence question, and it's a democratic question. What is the? How do we? Would we define fake news in a way that wouldn't um, censor uh, various kinds of alternative views that aren't part of the consensus mainstream, but at the same time would detect uh, psyops and propaganda and so forth. Um, I'm not sure that we know how to do that yet, uh, but I'm sure that we will have various kinds of experiments and people will uh, have hopefully have the option to use, you know, them, the ones that they consider the best. Um, <clears throat> just being able to choose how you filter your news on Facebook, you know, is, is in a sense the application of intelligence. You know, are you the kind of person who as soon as you see uh, uh, a political view that you don't like on Facebook, that you unfriend that person or take them out of your feed, or the kind of person that revels in those kinds of uh, disagreements. So I think we're already um, trying to figure this out. The, our, our use of these technologies is our exocortex. And in our exocortex, we are already trying to develop the kinds of tools that hopefully will be eventually be closer and closer uh, connected to our brains so that we have this kind of subconscious citizen running in the back of our head. Right, okay. Some of the um, people have been sort of concerned that we, we need to act very quickly um, and, and don't want to see a step-by-step -step, uh, sort of process here. They, 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 if, if there was, a solution that would solve these problems automatically in the near term, what do you think it would look like? 
So these people in the chat room asking questions or debating. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> as you know, um, I can. I think that the uh, project for prog techno progressives, for those of us who um, care about these technological questions and are politically progressive, is the global rise of a kind of neo-fascist, neo-authoritarianism that you see from Putin, Modi, um, Duterte, uh, you know, Brazil now has a, a, an, an ascendant right-wing movement, uh, and Trump, of course. <clears throat> and uh, the Chinese Sesame uh, platform that they're going to unroll this kind of uh, crazy dystopian um, hyper-nudging system that they're, they're developing. So I think we do need to have an urgency about the democratic project and the way that it might be threatened both by the internal collapse of democracy in the West as an attractive option for the world and the uh, apparent robustness of neo-authoritarian projects like uh, Putin and, and China. So um, how do you do it then? Well, I, it's going to be messy because democracy is messy, but I think uh, we are doing it. I mean, I think that the, 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 the use of these technologies as we see it uh, in Facebook and Twitter and uh, blog, the blogosphere and so forth is a robust exempl exemplification <laughs> of how democracy interacts with these kinds of communication medias and the filtering that they do. But we do need people who are <clears throat> thinking more intensively and experimenting with creating new tools. Like, for me, I think one of the breakthroughs would be, could we come up with an electronic platform that would uh, connect people in the way that Marx thought only the industrial workplace would, uh, providing them with the kind of um, sense of community that would create bottom-up organization that could be a countervailing power to the capitalist class? Because especially as work disappears, but already as work has changed under the impact of deindustrialization and the rise of white collar employment, <clears throat> uh, we don't have those kind of workplaces anymore uh, where there's a, a thousand of us in the, in the, you know, we could all lay down our tools at the same time and march out with our fists in the air. You know, it's just, it's a different kind of workplace and work may start disappearing. And so we really need to think about what does it mean to organize the non-class of non-workers, you know, the non-proletariat of the world. Um, and I don't see anything. I see, you know, the capacity to, to organize a, a, a flash mob uh, through Twitter or Facebook and a... And a, and a get up campaign. And, right, yeah, get, you know, yeah, Nation a fund builders. me campaign or a, a dank meme stash or whatever. But I, I don't see anything that brings people together with the same kind of oomph that a face-to-face -face organization of the 20th century would have done. So, I, you know, we really need those kinds of experiments, um, uh, bottom-up electronic organizing experiments. We also need these experiments in uh, how to do online deliberation. I, I remember when we first started the... Uh, World Transhumanist Association's board of directors, and we wrote into its constitution that the uh, board meeting would be 24/7, 365. We would we would always be meeting because every communication between uh, to the board group would be considered part of the official communications of a board meeting. And whenever we felt like there would needed to be a vote, we would. Somebody would propose a vote, and it would be seconded, and, and it would be voted on, and so forth. But there would be no formal meeting at which a vote occurred, right? It would just be kind of ongoing. Um, and that's hard to do, and we kind of did, because there were only 12 of us or 10 of us, <clears throat> we were able to do that on an ongoing basis. But how you do that for anything bigger, you know, how you do that for 50 people or 100 people, you really need a new architecture. And there are groups experimenting with this, what it means to have Robert's Rules of Order, what it means right. to have records and accountability, and, and to translate all that 20th century architecture into electronic governance. Uh, th right. Those so, are the kinds so of experiments. there is some research being done. Who's doing the research? And what other organizations or think tanks could help? Could um, EA health or effective altruism health? Is there any 
particular bodies <laughs> that you'd you'd like to see um, work on on this? Well, don't get me started on effective altruism. I mean, the fact that so many of them have come to the conclusion that the only effective altruism is to work on the uh, catastrophic AI problem, I think, is a perfect example of the uh, the lack of collective intelligence through certain kinds of you know online communication. It's basically a, a cult around a certain set of ideas. But um, yes, I mean, I, yeah, we need we a lot of thousand flowers bloom. I mean, we need. Um, uh, not all kinds of nonprofit attention. I, I actually I detail a number of them in the paper, uh, different kinds of experiments. There's this Icelandic software tool, Active Citizen, um, that is using AI to filter news. There's the Map the Power project, which has this little uh, CIS um, group source database of elite power connections that's trying to do the kind of power structure analysis through group, through collective sourcing that we that used to be very painstaking uh, uh, labor intensive research on the part of social scientists, uh, Ushahidi, uh, which was developed uh, has been used by the Kenyans to do crowdsourcing of reports of election violence, and so so that in a lot of different domains there are people who are doing this kind of research. There's the MacArthur Foundation has an open governance initiative. Uh, where they're collecting and supporting various initiatives around this kind of uh, government transparency and and uh, citizen participation in, in governance decision making around the world. And another really cool one is the um, Descent Project, uh, which has helped the Helsinki City Council develop an app that the different uh, citizens of Helsinki can participate in re uh, electronic referenda through and um, uh, and also there's a lot of urban uh, uh, initiatives around this. You know, Chicago, the city of Chicago has a data transparency initiative where it makes publicly accessible various kinds of anonymized data and crime and potholes and all kinds of things so that citizens can develop apps and, and uh, do their own analyses. So I think there's all kinds of um, efforts that are connected to this project at various kinds of levels. What I think the, the goal, however, the reason I think it's important to articulate is that my recent re-engagement with the left, um, because you know, I, when I started getting involved with the transhumanists and, and with the uh, IET, uh, it was because of a frustration with the organized political left in the United States, which was basically a pimple on the uh, political landscape. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I can make more of a contribution through participating in the futurism and transhumanism debates and trying to infuse those with politics. But you know, now that the, I felt so, so urgent to be re-engaged with the left in the last uh, year or so uh, because of Trump, um, the, the millennial left, in my experience, is very retro 20th century Marxist and not thinking about the questions of the future. They're not, th and they're, they're not even thinking about the questions of the future that were posed by socialists you know, 150 years ago. There, were, there have been people in the, in the political left thinking about what it means to wither the state in a, in a very concrete way. Um, and they're not thinking about that yet, or most, mostly in my experience. So we really need to, just as in the technological and uh, the technological unemployment debate. You know, most of the people in the policy domain, in, including people, you know, like the labor unions, think tanks, and so forth, they're still wedded to a workerist notion of what the political possible is, which is that we could still get everybody to ha to have a job, and that that would be the best future. And that is both ahistorical, because that, that's always been a debate within the left, whether eliminating work would be better than getting everyone a job, um, but also is probably a futurological, because it, we, it may very well be that we're not going to be able to all have a job in the future. So we need to think about what does it mean to have an attractive, egalitarian future where there's no more work? And that's where the universal basic income comes in as well. Well, what does that mean in terms of governance? Because I. I don't see anybody in the left talking about um, how we keep accountable uh, governance as the state shrinks, right? They, the, you know, some of them are thinking about making it more accountable. Some of them are thinking about expanding it by expanding public employment and public ownership. 
Uh, but very few are thinking about what does it mean when the state actually shrinks? And so that's part of the question. Then, then the question is, well, how do we create these new 21st century countervailing institutions that replace the faded and dead model of social democracy that we inherited from the 20th century? Right. Okay. So, um, hmm. well, how do you think we can uh, sort of bias people's awareness um, towards what's happening with, com with companies like Cambridge Analytica, who are owned by a, um, a, a foundation that was is very conservative? What can we do to uh, raise awareness of um, the potential that the people are being nudged without? necessarily being aware um, so you know recently in the news there's been um, no Julius in Asante is sort of said that the Cam Cambridge Analytica um, have tried to reach out to him to get data um, and to work together for some reason have to help the Trump administration get in but uh, WikiLeaks um, or Julian said WikiLeaks refused Anyway, but yeah, I mean, so who, who uh, Cambridge Analytica was paid $5.9 million to, for the Trump campaign, right? That's, you know, not a small amount of money, I guess. Hmm. Anyway, what are your thoughts? Well, I wanted to cover this. So I thought it was a good opportunity. Well, there was an article uh, like six months ago uh, about Jared Kushner and how what a genius he was. Maybe it was longer than that, nine months ago, um, where it implied that his use of Cambridge Analytica tools really won Trump the election. And there's been an ongoing debate since then about, well, did, did they ever really do anything? Did they get the data in time and so forth? Um, with the addition of the Russian element, it seems like there may have been a substantive contribution from Cambridge Analytica in the targeting of the PSYOP campaign. And, and so I do take that seriously. Um, whether, you know, it was decisive, I think there's, you know, a dozen things that were decisive. I mean, Hillary was a crap candidate. Um, you know, she did not take the populist turn that she needed to take, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of reasons why we lost this thing. But, um, and, we, and we really didn't lose it because, you know, it's the... the the founding fathers lost it for us by creating a really stupid and undemocratic structure for how to determine federal governance. But, um, but yes, I think that the Russians certainly tried to, and they're certainly patting themselves on the back for creating uh, chaos and maximum confusion in our democracy. And they're trying, and they have been trying to do the same thing to the Germans and the British and so forth with Brexit. And Cambridge Analytica and members of the Trump campaign were actively trying to solicit their uh, their help and to use these tools for this purpose. Now, all that said, uh, you know, the history of both commercial and political advertising is a long one. And it's not as if this is the first time people have tried to use big data to pull the wool over the uh, democracy's eyes. You know, this is the whole history of, of political advertising is is basically that one way or another. Um, it's just usually not so um, eagerly uh, that you court a, an active, hostile foreign power to support your candidate. That's the really unusual element in this case. Okay. Well, I mean, so uh, do you agree with many of the reports that, um, uh, like, do you think that the Cambridge Analytica will be implicated in um, some nefarious dealings? at a government level? Do you think they had a lot to do with the Brexit um, strategy? I mean, do you think that, you know, that we've just spoke about the uh, the Trump campaign then. So, so do you think yeah. that they'll, have a, they'll, they'll, they'll be implicated even further? Because just recently, I mean, I've been watching it for a little while, but just recently it's been in the news um, that they, they're under fire at the moment. Yeah, I don't know so much about the Brexit case um, and with Cambridge Analytica, but the the internationalization of uh, the conservative and neo-fascist um, Trumpite movement uh, means that you do have political 
operatives and political resources that are being um, international as well. And Manafort, who was just indicted today here in the United States, um, you know, he was deeply in, engaged in trying to uh, bring Russian, pro-Russian forces to power in Ukraine and, and so forth. And, you know, Republican operatives have been engaged in right-wing political campaigns all around the world trying to use the tools that were pioneered by Paul Vigory, you know, back in the 1970s of how to use the 1970s version of big data, um, you know, uh, consumer databases and uh, targeted advertising and so forth. So, it, you know, it, it would not at all be a surprise. And even if we're not able to prove that Cambridge Analytica played some decisive role in Brexit or, you know, had a nefarious role with the Russians, it, it, is, in still, it is still the problem <laughs> that the kind of th threat that they pose is an ongoing and active threat. Now, that said, I mean, I... I I do want us to be attentive to it, and we are relatively attentive to it in the West, but just to flip over to the decline of democracy and the decline of the American uh, leadership in Pax Americana and the decline of the soft power of the, of the EU uh, as a, a global symbol um, to the emergence of the Chinese model which is, I think, and needs to be equally on our mind, how the Chinese are, being, are, are uh, leveraging big data. And of course, they've already been very active in cyber espionage and cyber warfare, um, uh, cyber, you know, not as blatantly as the Russians, but <clears throat> um, the, the, so, the Sesame social credit system that they're building, I think, has the capacity to build a truly novel form of dystopian social control, hyper-nudging social control, uh, which I don't know how attractive it's going to be in the rest of the world. But I keep, a, you know, like many people since the collapse of the Soviet Union, I keep expecting the Chinese to fall apart. I thought Tiananmen Square was the, the first, you know, beginning of that. Um, they have 17 different ethnic groups. They, you know, they had to basically shut off internet access to the Uyghur provinces because of Uyghur unrest. The Tibetans all hate uh, the Han Chinese and want to kick them out. Um, but, and, and they have enormous problems with corruption and they're trying to transition from an export-led economy to a domestic cons consumption economy. <clears throat> so they have enormous problems um, uh, in the, uh, facing them. But with this Sesame social control mechanism by which they're going to uh, create a social reputation score for every citizen that is a combination of their debt worthiness, their uh, a judgment, a political judgment about the worthiness of their lifestyle and consumer habits, a judgment about the political uh, valence of their social media participation and a judgment about your friends in social media by collecting the big data and social network around each person and saying, well, this per the person themselves didn't say anything nasty about the Chinese state, but their friend's friend said something nasty about the Chinese state, and that's kind of suspicious. So their social credit score goes down. That's hyper nudging people to not only self censor and uh, eat right and exercise so the state gives you points for that and not to play too many video games so you don't get points for that and pay your debts on time, <clears throat> but also to not have the wrong kind of friends, right? It's really a social control at a really threatening dystopian black mirror kind of level. And, and I think if the Chinese state is able to maintain, uh, you know, social stability through this period that this of transition that they're going through with this mechanism, then they will clearly become a more attractive and dominant world power. That's that I think is very threatening to me. It's not that I, w I wish disorder and chaos on the Chinese people, but I would just wish them a little bit more transparency and a little bit less authoritarian totalitarian control. Right. Okay. So, I mean, what can we do then? I mean, well, for us in uh, more democratic societies, what can we do to reduce the effects of notice when we're being nudged or notice when we're sort of existing in filter bubbles um, that, you know, can be targeted by 
organizations like Cambridge Analytica where, you know, you get advertising. I mean, a lot of this may be at the subconscious level in the sense, you know, you've got little um, suggestive advertisements in the bottom of your Facebook feed or, or something like that. And you got people coming in suggesting things and, and whatnot. Is that you've heard of the idea of a filter bubble, right? Yeah. yeah. So what, what, what can um, individuals do to make sure they're, they're not being um, inadvertently biased by these sorts of things? I mean, you and me, well, just <laughs> everybody who's watching right now. Well, you know, when we invented VCRs, uh, people immediately started to use them to record their favorite programs and then fast forward through all the advertising, which annoyed the hell out of the industry. Um, and so there were various experiments. Could we ban uh, fast forwarding, you know, things like that? Uh, um, that didn't work so well. But the way it's evolved now is that if you want uh, access to a particular TV program in real time, you have to sign on to the app to watch it on your laptop, uh, you know, the ABC or the NBC or the CBS app. And then when you turn on that program uh, that you, they'll, they'll say you could watch it, you know, as soon as it's available, you, you turn on that program, you can't fast forward through the ads anymore, right? That's the, the and the experience of YouTube and, <clears throat> and other kind of enforced advertising. So it's this cat and mouse game. We don't want to be, most of us don't want to be subject to this involuntary force feeding of consumer capitalism uh, that most of it, which is not hyper uh, personalized to us in the first place. I mean, you know, I get all these ads for cars and all kinds of things that I don't want. I'm constantly telling Facebook, <clears throat> don't show me this ad anymore. And they say, why? Is it offensive? No, it's just not uh, relevant to me. I, I don't have toe fungus, so just don't show me the toe fungus ad, ad anymore. Um, so if it was hyper-personalized, you know, maybe I wouldn't be so annoyed, but most advertising is still not hyper-personalized. Uh, but they're still trying to force feed it to us, and we have this technological cat and mouse game of trying to get around that. Um, that, I think, is a, is a current example of the kind of um, resistance, citizen-level, consumer-level resistance to this, uh, you know, technological hyper-nudging. Now, in the case of political disinformation, you know, um, the idea of how we build in a kind of automatic or AI Snopes into our Facebook feed or something like that, that's, I think, as I said, it's going to be a very complicated endeavor. Uh, and there may be a right-wing version of it and a left-wing version of it and a green version of it or whatever. Um, but I, I do think that we will probably see some of those tools very soon. Um, <clears throat> there's, you know, there in, in web browsing, there has been for a decade or more uh, web browsers that will block uh, pop-up ads. And there was a huge debate in... Uh, you know, the various uh, web browsing innovators about whether they, if they built this kind of pop-up ad blocking in, would uh, it piss off the sponsors of various kinds of content? And I don't know. I, I, I remember Cory Doctorow uh, going into great depth about um, how this debate had played out. And it, whenever I listen to Corey, I just get uh, depressive on we about the future of the internet and how, and how uh, undemocratic it is. But it still seems like you know the fact that people wanted ad blocking built into their browsers or a capability uh, was a positive uh, sign of resistance. So I, I don't think um, that uh, you know we need to all have these brain computer interfaces before we can start doing this. It's already happening in the various tools that we have. Right, yeah. And then so um, what about at a population level then? What can we do to, I guess, bias the outcomes such that we we are we have a more democratic society, a more informed democracy, um, and we are aware of attempts at nudging and sort of segregation into filter bubbles, where we just get confirmations and what we already believe all the time. We're, we're not mixing with people from other um, tribes or filter bubbles, in a sense, and you know, uh, people outside our um, circle of friends or colleagues or peers 
are considered as enemies or unknowns or, you know, sort of the classic tribal behavior. Tribalism isn't going to go away, um, but we need to be aware of it, I feel. We need to be aware that it, that it is there and, that, um, and, and act accordingly, um, you know, to, to realize that we're not just living in tribes anymore. We're, we're living in a, on a, on a, in a global environment and, and so we need to sort of change our habits. But in how are we going to do that at population level? What, where do you see the most promising um, developments in the future, whether that be uh, research or even um, at the level of technology now? Well, so the, the techno-optimistic version of this is that the more that people communicate around the world, the less tribal they would become, uh, the more they would develop a sense of global identity. And I think that there, that is broadly true. Um, I think that you know part of the Flynn effect and, and is that the more <clears throat> complex society has become and the more kinds of people you meet, um, the more capable you are of imagining radical uh, otherness, other possibilities. You know, uh, there's a, a good literature now on on literature's effect on empathy. That the more you read about, uh, you know. Um, Romantic literature, for instance, is especially good at this. Not as science fiction isn't as good at this, unfortunately. Uh, I would have thought science fiction would have been better, but I, maybe I read a better quality of science fiction. But um, but romantic literature apparently really expands people's capacity for imagining what uh, other people's kinds of lives are. Um, but in general, the more exposure you have to foreign films and travel and and all these kinds of things, the the better it is apparently for you to have a cosmopolitan, not parochial point of view. Now, does this reduce political tribalism? I think I, as, a, as an activist and as a sociologist, I'm, uh, I think that we can, have, we can go too far in saying that people shouldn't be tribal. I mean, I think we need, for organizing purposes and for deeply psychological reasons, <coughs> to have a sense of identity and a sense of belonging to various kinds of communities. And as I said, I think that there's also this built-in dynamic of democracy that I may not be an expert on every issue, but I know that I'm an X. And as an X, uh, you know, the X's over here are saying this, and the X's over here are saying that, and therefore I'm gonna give them the high five, that's the X point of view. Um, I think that that is an inescapable decision architecture of democracy. Um, I, I don't think that every one of us is going to say, hmm, uh, I have no pre-existing political point of view about taxation policy, even though I decided over here that I like trade unions. I don't know if that has any relevance to how I feel about taxation. And I will read a couple books about taxation and try to come up with a non-tribal point of view. No, I'm, I'm a socialist. I'm, I'm for taxing the rich. I'm for trade unions. You know, that's, um, that's the way I feel about things as a socialist. Um, so I think that that's relatively inescapable. But <clears throat> I do think that the way that this plays out in terms of cosmopolitanism is that there's substantial evidence that tribalism is not symmetrical. In other words, the, the tribalism of the right is far more hermetic and ignorant than the tribalism of the left. The left can be tribal, but uh, in general, the left is more open to other points of view. You can see this in uh, network analyses of the internet, that the connections, the information connections between liberal and left websites, points of view, uh, sources of information is far more diverse and diffuse than the hermetically sealed world of the right-wing internet. Now, I don't know how that plays out in China or other places, but that's the way it is in the United States. You know, the, you look at the Pew research on the, po the political uh, valence of uh, the citizenry and what kinds of things they read. The left reads about 25 different kinds of magazines and newspapers and watches a uh, half a dozen different uh, TV channels. The right uh, listens to Fox News, right-wing radio, and you know, I don't, I don't think they read. So it's basically Fox News right wing radio. Um, <laughs> so you know, you 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 have basically the Pravda of the right, um, and then this huge uh, uh, 
diversity of points of view on the left, which are all left wing, but they're, they are a diversity of points of view. So it's not symmetrical, this problem of tribalism. Right, okay. Um, so, okay, that being it not so symmetrical, how are you going to convince um, the right wing or to, to be um, a little bit less tribal and a little bit less hermetically sealed? Do you think it's possible? Um, are there any, unless, uh, instead of just seeing them as foes or whatnot, how, what, what's the best way to convince everybody to be uh, more open to information coming from what's considered opposite sides of the political spectrum and to do a bit more wide reading? Well, first we discredit and imprison their leaders, and then we salt their ground with salt, you know, uh, well, their ground with salt. But um, <clears throat> to give you a tribal answer, um, okay, so my brother <clears throat> uh, announced to me last October that he's a, he's a working class guy in Ohio. So he's an angry, mar economically marginal guy in Ohio. So the precisely the target for the Russian PSYOPs and uh, the uh, deciding factor in the last year's election because Ohio, Michigan, so forth flipped. Um, and he announced to me last October that if it wasn't going to be Bernie Sanders, he was going to vote for Trump. Now, he's a former union uh, official with his uh, grocery store union. Um, he only recently got health care through Obamacare, uh, voted for Obama twice has always been a Democrat. Um, and to go from Sanders to Trump was, you know, it wasn't a common thing, but it was indicative for this particular kind of angry white man. And I tried to argue with him. I said, look, don't you see the similar, this was a u useless argument, but don't you see the similarities between Mussolini or Hitler and this guy Trump? He's a, he's a fascist. And he said, yeah, but he sent me some news articles. Don't you see this news? And the news articles last October were things like Sharia law is planning to be imposed in his neighboring town in Ohio. I said, well, I, I just looked this up and uh, it was not true. It's, you know, Snopes shows that this is not true. And they said, well, yeah, well, look at this one. Uh, Democrats steal 200,000 ballots and are preparing to stuff them on election day. Uh, well, that's not true. That turns out to be disinformation. You shouldn't be paying attention to that. They said, yeah, but I, I just don't like Hillary. And I said, well, what don't you like Hillary? You, you liked Hillary better than Obama when it was a white woman running against a black man. You know, not to cast aspersions on my brother, but that was the case. Uh, what, what changed about Hillary in the meantime? And there was an enormous, you know, well, she's not trustworthy, blah, blah, blah. So the, the emails, the Benghazi, all the kind of disinformation that the Republicans have been spreading. So I didn't talk, after the election, I didn't talk to him for 10 months. I was so pissed off that angry, you know, misinformed, angry white men like him had turned our country over to a clear fascist danger to the world, to world security. Um, but he was not to blame, right? So your, your point about <clears throat> overcoming tribalism is well taken because I've reestablished my relationship with my brother. Uh, he was not to blame. He was a victim of psyops and disinformation. And he had the legitimate gripe that my country has systematically disempowered and not given attention to the economic security of, of people like him. Now, it, then it all got turned in a bad direction against immigrants and Mexicans and, you know, Muslims and so forth in a crazy direction. And that's the danger that we face globally is that if we don't have a viable left uh, economic vision of the future that is engaged with the, quest, the technological reality that we face, then the fascists are happy to step in and provide the wrong targets that will allow them to prop up the existing power structure and economic structure that they in the end serve. So I agree, we need to overcome the tribalism. We need to do that by building the coalition of the 99% against the 1%. I don't think that that's the only important cleavage in our world, but that is the most important one 
because it allows the majority to be united against the minority, which is becoming increasingly disproportionately wealthy around the world. So <clears throat> basically, <laughs> I, I sound like I'm going back to 20th century Marxism. I'm really not. I'm a, I've always been a post-Marxist, but um, you know, it really comes down to building the class struggle. If you build the class struggle, you can uh, build the right kind of algorithmic governance, and you can fight the fascists. Right, but do you know this class struggle idea has been sort of co-opted by various groups? I mean, sometimes people think the oppressors are the scientists, and so now you've got a bunch of, uh, you know, and NASA, now you've got a bunch of flat earthers out there um, arguing that the, the world is under a big dome, and, and uh, organizations like NASA um, uh, doctoring photos uh, in order to uh, perpetuate an idea that, you know, th th there's these people at the top, the elites, the horrible scientists and all that. This is being framed as a class struggle against the wrong target. We right. Well, in American politics, this was pioneered by Nixon, you know, the nattering nabobs of negativism and blah, 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 blah. The, the, the notion that the, the Democratic Party to the extent that it started to associate it, itself with educated cosmopolitanism as the basis of its politics without the class struggle aspect, right? I believe in the cosmopolitanism. I, I'm a feminist, I'm an anti-racist, um, I'm a civil libertarian. All of the things that tend to come with the higher education and with cosmopolitan affluence, um, yes, <laughs> I believe in all that. But if that's the only element of your politics, without the class struggle, then you're going to lose all the native-born working class to the fascists, right? So, you know, part of that uh, shift in our politics of the left being associated with cultural elitism is also a shift in attitudes towards science <clears throat> and towards higher education. In recent surveys, the majority of Republicans say that higher education is bad for the United States, right? They, there used to be a difference, but not that big a difference, right? Now the majority of them say that because all you get in, from higher education in the United States, they believe, is a bunch of nonsense political correctness and an expensive college degree that doesn't do anything for you. Well, they might be right about the economic part of it, and they might be right about some of the nonsense political correctness that leads to certain institutions. Um, but, you know, if you basically give up, you know, you, you're basically saying, we want to go back to the 13th century. If you want to give up on science, technology, and higher education. Um, the techno-optimism, I think, is a, for techno-progressives, it's especially important to pay attention to this partisan divide that has emerged around science. You know, it used to be that uh, the scientific endeavor was associated with the national project and therefore was a bipartisan project. You know, uh, on the left, Marxists were against uh, the stupidity of religion and wanted to uh, have, you know, electrification uh, for everybody. And the, the, the left used to vigorously embrace science and reason and technology. And the right did too, you know, most of the right, um, except for the culturally conservative nabobs. Um, but then after, uh, you know, the ascendance of the climate change issue, of the ascendance of uh, the, the religious right under Reagan within the Republican Party, you had this perfect storm of anti-science attitudes, what um, Chris Mooney calls the Republican War on Science, <clears throat> George W. Bush deepened that uh, set of political divides, and now Trump has put the final nail in the coffin because you can't be an educated person and sign on to Trumpism in the United States. Um, and so now you have a kind of 90% in the last election, 90% of American scientists voted Democratic for Hillary. Um, you have this kind of, you know, complete ignorant ignorance about science and, and anti-science attitudes in every sector of governance on the part of the Republican right. So now, I don't think that's good. I think it would be better if everybody from right to left supported science the way they used to. But 
it does mean that the techno progressive political current has a vehicle because of this con con convergence of the scientific interest and the left interest uh, in a way that it didn't in the past. You know, so for instance, engineers used to be far more reactionary, uh, but now even engineers are tilting to the left. So this I think is great. Now, they don't always tilt to the left in the way that I would like. They don't tilt to the left necessarily in the class struggle aspect. Um, you know, you, the Silicon Valley left is libertarian uh, left. It's, it, you know, you can uh, be against uh, racism. You can be, you know, be for gender equality, but just don't uh, touch my multi-billions with your redistributive uh, hands. Uh, so that's a different kind of left, but, uh, you know, part of the broad spectrum of left. Um, at any rate, I think that there's a lot of things that are moving in a direction that points to the political currency of a techno-progressive set of arguments. And one of them is this anti-elitism, anti-science, anti-rationality, um, uh, uh, isolationism on the part of the, the political right. Um, another concern that I have um, is that politics is largely driven by trying to get people to identify with personalities. Like, for instance, you know, if you listen to a political speech, um, it may, may not be apparent, but there seems to be keywords or phrases doctored to um, appeal to various different demographics in the audience uh, being targeted at that time. So you don't need to uh, address the actual policies as long as you can get people on your side by saying, oh, you know, I like this guy. I don't like that person over there. That person, you know, she seems like, dishonorable or whatnot to forget about looking at the policies now we can just identify what's right by looking at the character of the human um standing up there and so the way to get people on your side of course is to um use keywords or uh you know hooks in order to get people people's attention and then um well when you've got their attention um say something that they'd agree with or that they'd identify with and look, because um, I don't know what the keywords or uh, the phrases for identification are for other tribes in the world, they do. I don't know when it's going on necessarily very easily uh, when, it, when it's happening, unless they're using keywords or identifiers that address my circle. So yeah, how, how do we get people to recognize and respond to this issue? Well, <clears throat> again, I think it's, how much of the bottom, how, how much is politics responding to the aggregation of deliberative bottom up democracy and how much is it shaping it? Um, you know, Beppe Grillo in uh, Italy, or Grillo, um, and the Five Star Movement, one of the things that they at least promised that they would do, apparently they're not doing it very well. Um, and there's a lot of problems with them, anti-immigrant politics and so forth. But uh, one of the things that they promised that they would do is that they would have, instead of rep their representatives of their party, have the freedom to vote their conscience, that they would have ongoing plebiscites among their party members that would determine how they voted. <clears throat> and, um, you know, this is, I think, an interesting idea that, um, you know, that as long as we have the existing structures of representative democracy, that we would try to build into it somehow the mechanisms of e-democracy, of direct a publicitary democracy. Um, I don't know how well it would work and, and so forth, but part of the problem with democracy is always, okay, then what questions get shaped, right? And how did the, you know, how did the, how does this process actually work? In the United States, since the 1930s, uh, polls have shown that a third to half of Americans wanted um, universal health care, wanted universal public insurance. And uh, we have very rarely had the opportunity to have to vote for a candidate or not much less to vote for on a plebiscite uh, or a referendum about whether we could have such a system. 
Um, and that's because the political decisions that are elected representatives under the influence of the you know big business and the doctors and the hospitals and the insurance companies, they basically always said that's not even on the table. During the Obamacare debate, one of the things that the left wanted to at least be debated, you know, we would have liked to have seen it adopted, but at least debated was to have a public option. That is that um, among the various private health insurance plans that people get a choice of, one would be a public option uh, that you could put your public, you know, basically buy into uh, what we call Medicare here, the, the public health insurance plan. Um, and Obama was told by the insurance companies that they would withdraw from and campaign against the Obamacare reform if that uh, question was even debated. And so uh, public option advocates were thrown out of all the meetings about Obamacare that were the public meetings that were held. So, you know, this is, I think is exemplary of the problem that e even if you have grassroots referenda mechanisms, the questions that they get posed and that they then have some opportunity to participate in have to also be democratically formed, right? Otherwise, if it's just, you know, the Clintons and, the you know, the Trump, the Bushes saying, well, here's what we think the issues are, and you get to vote A or B on these two issues, go at it, have an electronic democracy. It doesn't work so well. So, uh, you know, this, the, but again, these are not new problems. This is an old problem in democracy. Uh, we just have to figure out if there are better ways to get around that problem in the electronic age. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yes, there is, a, 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 like Frank saying from the live chat has asked a question. He says that Arthur C. Clarke said that power and wealth become less important with the progression of science. Is this something that you agree with? Um, do, do you think that this statement is likely to be true long term? Power and wealth become less important with the progression of science. Uh, doesn't seem to have been the case. Um, <clears throat> I mean, right now in the United States, if you don't have access to uh, private health insurance, your life expectancy is about five years less. Uh, it may be that in the future, as our science and technology advances, that the difference between having health insurance and not is 50 years of life expectancy. So I think that um, if anything, science and technology magnifies the, the uh, impact of power uh, in society and power and wealth. Now, I also would make the argument that um, technological innovation is disruptive and it provides a new, la a new and constantly changing landscape on which the struggle for the democratization of power and wealth occurs. And the old socialist uh, utopian expectation was that there was some kind of te teleology in history that would lead towards an egalitarian final solution to all of the class struggle problems. Well, the solution's wrong term, but uh, you know, uh, an, an, end, an end to the, the problem of class struggle and class division. I don't think that there are very many of us who have that kind of optimism anymore. I certainly don't. I think it's possible, as, I, as I've suggested with the Chinese example, to imagine the persistence and perhaps even the final dominance of various forms of neo-feudalism or authoritarianism, uh, structured inequality, you know, reinforced by systems of social control that would be you know, what Bostrom called in his essay, one of the existential um, threats, you know, that there are existential threats that are bangs, you know, where we blow ourselves up. And then there are existential threats that are whimpers, where we evolve towards some kind of post-human state that none of us today would have ever wanted. Um, and I think that that's one of the threats here is that it, it's possible that the combination of science and technology with existing inequalities of the world could lead us in that direction. That was what H.G. Wells was worried about in uh, the time machine. He thought that the existing inequalities he saw in the class structure of England could evolve eventually into Eloys and, Mur uh, and Murlocs. And I think we need to worry about the same thing today. Right, uh, and that could be in the form of some sort of uh, um, 
stagnation, a technological stagnation where, where everybody's oppressed and science is, is, is not pursued anymore. And um, yes, uh, that would be quite a, a, a dystopian future in my view. Um, okay. Well, in the case, um, after watching this video, what do you hope viewers will go out and do? What, what do you think that it, it's uh, important for people to to realise and uh, what, what information should people um, take away the main point and, and act on and how should they act on it in a general well, question? Well, assuming that most of your audience, like you and I, are futurists and transhumanists and people engaged in this subculture, again, let me reiterate the point that the issues that we're concerned about in this discussion are not new issues and they're not future issues. They are old issues and ongoing issues. Uh, the issues of how to use communication and information technology um, to extend democracy and the struggle for equality are, is, an, is an old issue. It's as old as the Gutenberg press. Um, <clears throat> so I think we need to, in that context, understand that the kinds of political engagement that we have today around um, democracy within our own countries and international democracy um, are going to extend into the future as these new technologies and capabilities come online. I mean, when we have brain-computer interfaces, um, we're going to have issues of who owns them, uh, how private are they, how secure are they, could somebody control somebody else's behavior with them, and so forth, the issues that we've been thinking about for a long time. But those are extensions of the issues about who owns the information in your laptop or your, you know, the architecture of your laptop, and uh, can somebody hack into it, and how private and secure is it? Those are extensions of the issues of can somebody take away your books and burn them? What kinds of books, books are you allowed to own? What kinds of books are you allowed to write and publish? These are all continuous, right? So if you're concerned about freedom and democracy in the future, be concerned about freedom and democracy today, right? Fight for it today in the political institutions and avenues that you have accessible to you. There is a global neo-fascist movement partially organized from Moscow, but also in every capital in the world uh, attempting to reinforce the power of elites by mobilizing the most tribal and nativist and ignorant impulses of their populations around anti-immigrant sentiment, racism, and so forth. Fight it. That's what I advocate politically engage, fight it, and you will find in the course of your political engagement that people are talking about technology all the time. They're talking about healthcare, they're talking about communications technology, they're talking about the internet, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. All of these issues will lay the groundwork for whether we have a good singularity or a bad singularity. So yeah, it's get engaged, pay attention to the world, Make sure that we don't blow ourselves up and that this crazy, I mean, my, my basement's flooded right now because, you know, unusually we have this crazy hot weather out here, hot-tober as they called it. Why do you think that happened? Why do you think four hurricanes hit the United States in this last season and decimated Puerto Rico and Texas and Florida? You know, the world is in crisis and people need to be engaged. Pick the issue. There's lots of opportunities. Right. Okay. That's great. So, James, you're part of the, uh, the the managing director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. People can find out more by going to iwet.org. Um, and this, we've been discussing generally a lot of things, but there's a paper you're bringing out. What what um, mag what a uh, publication is that, that going to be brought out under? Jet the press, journal. It? No, it's Journal of Post-Human Studies okay, that uh, is being co-edited co by me and uh, Stefan Sorgner, and yes. it comes out twice a year. It's so if you're, you know, an academic, uh, it's a place to consider submitting. Jet, of course, is still open. The Journal of Evolution and Technology is still open for submissions. 
although it might be closed for submissions for the next six weeks or so, but it, it will be eventually open for submissions again and has a much broader mandate than the Journal of Post-Human Studies does. Um, and if you want to write things in a shorter uh, vein, uh, things in the 500 to 2,000 word range written for a public uh, audience, please send them to me and Steve Umbrello, the managing um, director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, and we'll consider putting them on our website and making you a contributing writer and maybe even an affiliate scholar of the IET. Okay, so there are a couple of ways that people can get involved in IEET. Um, any others that you, that, that's worth uh, mentioning here? You think they're the main one, ways that people can get involved in IEET or is there anything else? Well, what the big project that um, I have been trying to turn my attention to for the IET, um, besides finishing my long and now embarrassingly long uh, delayed book, Cyborg Buddha, um, is to pull together a, uh, a, a manual, a, a working book, um, pr probably both in electronic and printed form, of uh, what we call techno-progressive policies, it, we've got about 40 different policy domains outlined from things like how to uh, fund and regulate cognitive enhancement research and the longevity dividend and uh, artificial intelligence to um, uh, how to uh, protect the rights of people with uh, gender nonconformity. There's, there's a, a bunch of different issues uh, to catastrophic risks and and one of these is one of these topics is um, how to promote e democracy and electronic participation. So uh, we are looking for people who are interested in writing. Again, this would be about uh, a two thousand to three thousand word, well, two thousand word essay um, that would say, "Here's the problem, the social the social public policy problem. Here's the." reason that there's a techno-progressive perspective on this problem. And here's the different examples of laws, policies, thinkers around the world who have tried to address this problem. We want to be able to develop this handbook so that in the event, and we think there will be, that there are uh, techno-progressive legislators, we can, just like Heritage Foundation does, you know, when, when a conservative Republican is elected, the Heritage Foundation hands them a book and says, if you want to know what to think about trade policy, read this 2,000-word uh, essay, and then you're all set. We want to do that for techno-progressives around the world. Awesome. So if you're interested in that project, contact me. Yes, and that is just uh, what James at IWET.org. Director at IWEET.org, -E yes. Yeah, Directly. okay. Director at IEET.org. Okay, so yes, um, thank you so much, James, uh, for being on this Halloween special today. Hopefully, it hasn't uh, frightened you away from doing another podcast sometime in the future, or the viewers too. We don't want to frighten the viewers away too. So, thank you very if much. If you're not frightened, viewers. if you're not frightened, you're not paying attention. Right. Okay. Well, maybe it's appropriate that it's a Halloween special. So, but thanks so much to the viewers as well. Um, and if you're interested in more contact uh, content, please subscribe and and let me know uh, what you'd like to hear about. Um, we're always open to um, discovery or to discussing new and interesting things. But once again, thanks so much, James. Um, I'll be interviewing John Danaher actually tomorrow on robotic sex and uh, the, uh, the sociological uh, ramifications there. Um, and I think he is quite techno-progressive in this area. <laughs> but um, I guess we'll find out tomorrow. So that will be another uh, Halloween special. Mm -hmm. Well, well you, know, you, you know that like, you know, technology is going places, the people taking notice when it, when it starts to fulfill all sorts of um, uh, needs in Maslow's hierarchy there, don't you? <laughs> yes, I'm working on the top level, the cyborg Buddha, and mm -hmm. John's apparently interested in the bottom level. But, you know, he, John's interested in everything, so oh, yeah, yeah, he's an interesting great. guy. I should mention to viewers, and, and of course you know this, I've uh, interviewed John on um, issues of algocracy before, so I think it's a very interesting topic here, and, and, and certainly worth for uh, uh, people going away and doing a lot of wide reading on the subject as well. So been awesome, James, um, and thanks heaps for uh, tuning in, everybody, and please subscribe.
Thanks, Adam. Thanks, James. Speak to you soon.